Shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $2 million for the purpose of constructing the necessary upgrades to the wastewater treatment facility septic receiving station by purchasing and installing a Raptor septic acceptance plant or its equivalent in order to process septic effluent containing materials that otherwise can clog pumps and valves, decrease the effectiveness of plant aeration, dewatering and filtering equipment, and decrease maintenance costs. Attached there too will be a vehicle and equipment wash down facility that will accommodate all town equipment and operate in accordance with the requirements of the Clean Water and Air Act. Such appropriation includes improvements to the recycled wastewater yard piping to include the upgrading and replacement of the piping systems for the delivery of plant water to increase the efficiency of the treatment plant. Such appropriation includes safety improvements to the sewer plant valve pit, a hazardous work environment that employees must enter to operate the flow valves that control flow from the primary and sludge thickener tanks. Included in the appropriation is the design, engineering, purchasing and installing an emergency generator to power the aeration blower system that is not now connected to emergency power. A loss of power means a loss of secondary treatment in the plant that the town is required to maintain under law and its state and federal permits. Such sum to be raised by the issuance of municipal bonds or notes for a period not to exceed 30 years under and in accordance with the Municipal Finance Act and to authorize the Board of Selectmen and the town treasurer to issue and negotiate such bonds or notes and to determine the rate of interest thereon. To authorize the Board of Selectmen to apply for, contract for, accept and expend any federal, state or other available funds towards the projects in accordance with the terms and conditions under which they are received and to borrow in anticipation of the receipt of such and or the issuance of such bonds or notes as provided in the Municipal Finance Act uh, and it's amended. And to authorize participation in the state revolving fund established for the purpose and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to apply for, accept and expend such monies as they become available from the federal and state government and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to implement such cost-effective solutions as are presented in the future and they deem to be in the best interest of the town that may result in a lesser amount of expenditure than is authorized by this Warren article. And to authorize the Board of Selectmen to take any and all actions necessary to carry out the project in the best interest of the town of Hampton. Three-fifths vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Not recommended by the Budget Committee 7-7. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 12? Ex yeah, Article 10, excuse me. Moved by Mr. Bean, seconded by Mr. Waddell. Mr. Bean, would you like to speak to the uh, Article 10? Simply that the selectmen support this and we defer to the uh, Public Works Director. Okay. Mr. Jacobs, would you like to speak to Article 10? Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Jacobs, uh, Director of Public Works. This whole bond issue idea started back in April. Um, many of you know the former Public Works Director retired. Um, I stepped up and uh, was appointed to that position. In my first meetings with uh, the town manager, he asked me to encompass collectively all the issues I had within public works and more specifically within the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we identified probably 12 projects and they were uh, through a process of discussion and combining, we brought it down to these particular four, and it was at the suggestion um, of the town manager and others involved in the project, it was elected to bring it into one bond, uh, one bondable project. Four, the three of the four projects are too small in their uh, overall scope. While they're critical, they're, they're too small to actually be bonded. So that was the reason for bringing it to this um, to this point, if you will, of coming up with a bond. In brief, and um, if Christina can bring it up, maybe uh, the first slide, uh, PowerPoint slide for the sewer bond. We have four components of this project. Uh, septage receiving station. That's the one I'm looking for. She's wondering. Got it, thanks. Septage receiving station. Uh, combined with a washdown facility, uh, there's some internal yard piping that needs to, and that's piping below grade that needs to be corrected, improved, replaced. Um, we have a uh, concrete box or pit. It's below ground. Right now it's a um, two-man operation uh, because it's a confined space to get somebody in there. Um, 
high in odors, high in risk. Um, and we've also had uh, maintenance issues over the last two years with that. Mainly one of the pipes literally eroded out and uh, we had water spilling on the floor. Uh, the other fourth and probably the most major component to this is emergency power for the aeration tanks. In a very simple layman's term, when the wastewater comes into the plant, we first remove any grit from it. We secondly then send it up to what we call the primary clarifiers, which are just large swimming pools, um, where we settle out the heavier effluent. From there, it goes to um, aeration tanks. And the aeration tank would be shown on, yeah, the emergency generator sheet. Uh, right there. The lower photo shows you basically what the, that swimming pool looks like. We have four rectangular boxes. They're probably 30 feet deep. What we do is we push, pump air up through that um, effluent and through the process of bugs. Uh, we have active bug cultures in the effluent, uh, but they require a copious amount of electricity. Why is this important? It's those bugs that do all the work, to be honest with you. Um, they, those bugs live and breathe on whatever uh, food matter is in the effluent, uh, but they live, literally live and breathe and die on hourly basis so that they produce, well, they die and they fall to the bottom. They produce sludge. But to keep them going requires air. Why is that critical? Last summer, we had three days in a row where the air temperature was above 90 degrees, plus the humidity approached and was over 90 degrees. The air um, processes struggle when that happens. Um, so as part of this project, we're looking to upgrade our pumps, the actual air pumps themselves. But the bigger component is if we lose power, if there's a brownout in the Hampton area, I have a backup generator that runs all the pumps to the plant, but I don't have any way of getting air to these bugs to help them reduce the effluent. With that, what would happen is my fecal count would go up on my discharge water. Uh, I'd have to use a heck of a lot more um, chlorine to kill off the bugs before they actually leave the plant, before I pump them out into the, bro to the tidal brook. And from there, it would go to Hampton Harbor, and from there, who knows where, along the beach, but the harbor itself. So this is a very, very critical component of the whole process, and it's probably the, the linchpin of this bond project. I was asked at the um, deliberative session, uh, what is the probability of us being without power for, more, let's say, more than eight hours and losing all my bugs and discharging a lot of this dirty water? Probability is low. But understand that the impact of all that water leaving puts me in violation of, my, of our operating permit, puts me in direct conflict with the EPA. We could, they could institute fines. And secondly, the, probably the bigger critical component that I see is all that water goes out into the harbor and really affects the beach. We are a beach community. It's gonna impact that water and that water quality. So um, that's why this is a critical, critical uh, needed project. Um, another question that got asked is, why did the plant ever get built without air to begin with? Um, our plant started in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. We've had upgrades over the years. We had one of the early plants uh, back when the permit was granted in the early 70s to, to basically upgrade the plant. Air was not a requirement for the air to be on backup. The power was not part of it. Today, if we did the same project, it would be. It would be, it would be, uh, there would be no discussion. It would be part of the project. The other major component to this sewer bond is um, our septage receiving area. And I would go, Christina, to the, um, Septage receiving station. You got it right there. Right now, and the photos to key in on are the 
one in the lower right and the, the one in the lower left. The lower left is the facility as a whole. As you can see, it's just a bunch of concrete on the ground. The green thing in the back is a, um, just basically a green roll-off container where we collect the grit. For those of you on septic tanks, the picture to the right is the important one. What that shows is that's the back end of a septic truck and the discharge pipe coming out of it. And basically what, and I'm glad it's not closer because it's not a pleasant sight, um, the effluent from the septic tank uh, gets dumped or dropped into this facility, literally in that pipe. What we then have is um, a bunch of, it's not really, it, it's half liquid, half solid. And part of the problem is from that, we end up getting a lot, an awful lot of grit. Right now, the, it goes into two tanks, and literally, on an annual basis, we shut one tank down, don suits, go in there, and shovel it out. It's not really the most um, nicest thing to do and the best way to handle it. Uh, so what we're asking for is what they call, a, it's Lakeport, that's a, a brand name, but it's a, um, it literally siphons through all that material and takes out the grit, leaving, if you will, the, the flowable solids and the, and the water, which we then receive into the plant. Currently, um, as I say, we're trying to do things safer, more environmentally friendly, and uh, this would save us from having to shut this facility down and then hand dig it out uh, once or twice a year, depending on its need. Um, we do have a, a, a vacuum truck that we, we can actually use on it, uh, but to be honest with you, we've tried that and the material inside the tanks is too heavy to vacuum. It literally has to be shoveled out. So um, the other issue that we have with this is that it's open to the, to the weather. Um, we're currently at risk. That concrete area, if you could slide it more to the, to the, to that. Yeah, where the concrete areas are right there, you can see the, the two uh, rails where a truck aligns. Um, Right now, because we, we are dealing with a water-based system, and when we ask the, st uh, the septic haulers to wash down that area, they're using plant water, clear water, uh, but it leaves it very icy. So it's always a battle, how much do we clean it, and especially at this time of year. I, my biggest concern is somebody's gonna slip and fall um, and really injure themselves. It uh, hasn't happened yet. We've had just a few pulled backs from people slipping, but it is a, a very high risk. Associated to that, um, if we were going to enclose this in a building, which is part of the, uh, the weather tightness of this operation, we were going to build a bay adjacent to that for washing down all of our trucks. We have uh, um, trucks that that carry this sludge that we generate up to waste management, we need to wash those down. We have a street sweeper, we need to wash down on a daily basis. We have um, our snow removal vehicles, we need to wash them down. We pretty much wash them down every, after every storm to try and get the salt off of them because the salt corrodes the bodies. The problem is we're not capturing the way we should all the water that comes off of all those trucks, vehicles, um, we're dealing with, um, um, in some cases, waste uh, that, that shouldn't be on the road, it shouldn't be even deposited in the yard. So the idea, I know a couple of years ago there was a Warren article to have a um, separate washdown facility. It occurred to us this past year that if we were going to have a separate washdown facility, we'd also have to have a separate grit handling capability. This is the grit handling capability that the town currently possesses that we intended to upgrade. It only makes sense to put the wash down facility from a cost perspective right next to or adjacent to this septage receiving facility because we're dealing with the same kind of products, waste um, and runoff from the trucks. The other two components of this, oh, and can, you can go to the wash down facility slide. Um, lower right portion. That's our, uh, that picture there in the corner, that's our current washdown facility. It's a, a fire hose attached to a, a hydrant. 
and that's it. And then when the grit and dirt builds up on the ground, we go over and scrape it up with a backhoe and um, uh, sweep, push with brooms, things of that nature to get it off the ground to then deposit it into containers to take it off site. So it's a very um, rudimentary um, situation. And at this time of year, it really doesn't work because, uh, well, we don't really wash down things internal, externally like that. Um, we, um, we have to do everything internally and then, if you will, shovel or sweep it up off the floor. The, uh, if you could go to the yard piping um, slide, please. Looks like a puzzle, but it, it really isn't. Uh, the dashed lines show basically how effluent, uh, what, when you flush, when you rinse down sinks, uh, showers, it comes to the plant through those um, dashed lines. The, the dashed line to the left is what's coming down the major collection line off of Tide Mill Road. The um, dashed line upper right with those flow arrows is what's coming in what we call the Northeast Interceptor, interceptor be it the rest of town. And the dashed line that's coming from the bottom up through those round clarifiers on the left side of the photo, that's actually the Church Street pump station line. That's actually uh, how um, all the wastewater from the beach area, Brown Ave, Ashworth, uh, High Street, that's how it all gets to, um, gets to the plant. There's two force mains underneath the marsh and it's pushed from there into the headworks. The other zigzaggy line actually shows you the process that water takes through the, through the plant. Um, the most critical component being in the lower right portion where those four aeration lagoons are. And from there how it gets pushed uh, to those tanks to the left that looks those dark circles. That's actually the secondary clarifiers. The water, if you walked over there and looked at it, kind of looks like pond water. It's just, uh, you'd think it's safe to swim in, but I wouldn't. Um, and from there it goes through chlorine contact and discharges. What we're trying to do is that the, um, where it says headworks, um, so the top middle of the photo, right now we have no way of um, distinguishing, determining what we're getting for waste. Well, why is that important? Who really cares? Um, we have different strength waste coming from different portions of the town. And when it gets, sometimes when it gets commingled, it's too late to react to it. I equate running the wastewater treatment plant to uh, uh, creating a cake, but the ingredients change every 15 minutes. Um, some of you are aware we have now have a, a major brewery in town, Smutty Nose Brewery. Um, there's mornings that we open up the headworks um, except, expecting a not so pleasant smell and it smells like uh, a beer because of the strength of the waste that we're getting from, from Smutty Nose. We're able to deal with it but it comes in at such a slug um, that uh, it comes in in such a slug that it's, it's difficult to adjust the, the, the oven temperature and the other components we need to make to the cake to, to handle the waste. Uh, this beer waste that comes in is 10% uh, of our total load in the plant. It only makes up 1% of the gallons, but it's 10% of the load. Load meaning what we have to react to. It's like getting too much flour in a cake mix. You're going to have to add more milk, more eggs, more butter, more sugar, more whatever. Uh, so that's the issue that we're having. Right now, what we're trying to do is with this is to segregate those pipes, have them all not go into the same tank at the same time, and that way we can actually get grab samples out of each one of them, and that would allow us to run the plant more cost effectively, more efficiently. It would be able to, it would allow us to react to the uh, ingredients that we're getting on a hourly basis. The other th uh, project is just south of that where it makes the the right hand turn and I don't believe it's got a tag on oh okay. Uh, go to the valve pit improvements slide and I have to give credit to uh, 
my deputy director. Jennifer Hale pre prepared all these things. Um, she's the um, architect behind all this PowerPoint presentation. It's uh, good to have somebody on board. Uh, we make a good team. Um, she covers the strengths that, uh, that I don't have. Valve pit, right in the smack center of the plant. That's the square box, if you will, 10, 12 feet deep with a lot of internal piping through it, but it's got uh, 1950s technology, i.e. we have to put on a, um, not an air respirator, but we have to uh, use what we call the safety protocol for going in a confined space, which is put on a vest, uh, have a winch, have someone standing on the top and wear an air meter so that we're assured that there's sufficient oxygen when they go down in there. And that's just to go and turn a valve to, to trim the flow. This is, we use valves to adjust the ingredients for the cake mix, how much flour we're getting, how much effluent we're getting from certain sections of the plant. And the idea is that we don't have to climb down into that pit um, to, um, because it's a safety issue. That's the pit that two years ago on a Friday afternoon inspection, walking by, I heard water running in a place I'm not supposed to hear water running. So opened up the valve, at least the cover to the valve pit, and found that there was you know, a foot of water on the floor. Why? Because the, we talked before, why do I need a, a lake port grit removal system at the headworks? It's because the sludge had so much grit in it, it had literally scraped or scoured a hole right through the bottom of a 12-inch of a diameter pipe. A whole part of it was missing, and that's why all the effluent was on the floor. So, um, and, and when we had to repair or replace that, then again, it was all confined space work, um, close to needing air uh, packs or respirators because the amount of uh, sewer gases we deal with in those locations. So those, that presentation um, is a more, I hope, a more uh, layman's uh, presentation rather than uh, numbers and things of that nature. And at this point, I guess I would like to entertain any questions that my... Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jacobs. Thank you for the presentation. Is there anybody who's, who wishes to be heard on Article 10? Mr. Jones. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. Good morning. I would like to ask uh, DPW a question. Uh, he mentioned that at the, uh, I believe, he believe he said deliberative session, but I think he meant the Budget Committee's deliberation. Uh, we asked the question regarding risk. He responded to low. Uh, he mentioned that again today. And uh, presumably, if this one article passes, he's presenting it as a lower than low risk. And I'm wondering if you could make a statement that might give us some sense of quantification between low and lower than low. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I, I think, Mr. Jacobs, if, uh, if you can assign a percentage, I, I, I recall you making a comment about what's the risk of failure what's, for the generator. Is that what you're asking about, Mr. Jones? I think yeah. that is. The, the risk of not having emergency power in that facility has been one day out of 365 over the last year. Um, my biggest fear is that if we go through a ice storm like we did in late 80s, early 90s, and we're without power for uh, subsequent days, three to four, five days in a row, um, that's when we'll have a major release of bacteria. It would take me a couple of days to probably find on the East Coast a generator big enough to hire to come in and, uh, and also get wired in to uh, run the generator, the air, portion of the plant. So it is a 1 in 365 occurrence, but it's if it does occur, the outcome is not that pleasant. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jones, I've got a line of people here. I'm going to yield, uh, ask you to yield to Mr. Lang. I've got a lot of people who want to ask questions. So, uh, Sir? Thank you, Mr. Jones. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, um, David Lang, 66 Park Avenue. I have a question for the Public Works Director. Um, my understanding of your presentation, and thank you very much for explaining to us what happens after you hit flush. Um, but um, my question is this. It appears to me that we're dealing with 1940s and 1950s technology, um, and this is a Band-Aid approach 
um, to this. How long is the life expectancy of these changes? And then after the question, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to speak on. All right. Mr. Jacobs, if you can respond to Mr. Lang's question. The life expectancy, uh, none of the projects are Band-Aid projects. Um, valve pit improvements um, have been designed. I would say it's a 20, 30 year before the valves themselves would have to get replaced. What we're going to do is automate the valves. Internal piping, uh, that's a once in a lifetime. We're just trying to uh, improve on the original construction, 1970s construction. So you can see we're talking 45 years after the initial construction. Um, the aeration, the generator, um, I would say we'll probably get 30 years out of the generator before we'd have to even think about replacing it. Uh, part of the project is to resize the blowers, or at least the motors that push air, uh, making them more um, energy efficient. Um, so that's a, that's a 30, 40, 50 year project. Uh, the air handling equipment that's in there is late 70s. So we've gotten a number of years out of it. Uh, we have had to do some maintenance and repairs. And septage receiving, I would say that's a 40 or 50 year uh, improvement. The, the technology really wouldn't change. The equipment will rust and corrode due to the, the gases generated in the wastewater project before the, uh, the project is, you know, needs to be redone or improved or replaced or maintained. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Mr. Lang, quick follow-up so we get through this line. Uh, one of the, uh, just very quickly, one of the concerns that I have is that sometimes in government we, we take out a 30-year bond for a project that's not going to last as long as the debt that we have, and we find ourselves in a position that we end up throwing good money after bad. So I would caution the voters with respect to um, bonding something that may or may not last as long as the, uh, the warranties that are on the, the equipment that we're doing or the upgrades that we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Mr. Nichols. Um, my question is related to the uh, fiscal impact note. The uh, version of this Warren article which was available for the public hearing, I believe, at least an earlier version than what I picked up out front today, had a fiscal impact note. That fiscal impact note stated the estimated tax impact for 2016 would be on an interest payment of $63,000, which is 2.3 cents per thousand. Uh, the estimated tax impact on 2 million is 71.7 cents per thousand. Um, I don't know if it was an oversight, but there is no tax impact statement on this Warren article and I would further point out that Article 5 from 2013, um, the voters approved by a margin of 2,108 to 172 that tax impact statements or fiscal notes are required on all articles. So I, I have no problem with the original impact statement, but what happened to the fiscal impact note? Certainly. Does anyone on the uh, board or uh, the finance director have a comment on Mr. Nichols' question about the fiscal impact note? Can we get that back up, or is there a reason it's, it's not there? Moved because when we reviewed the article, we realized there would not be a pain. We wouldn't have the uh, financing and the bond in place in 16 because of the way that the, once we put it out to bond and then the, I think it's 255 days, I believe, before your first payment is due, and therefore that we remove the fiscal note because there won't be a payment on the bond in 2016. Can I respond to that? Sure. Yeah, if you go to Article 5 from 2013, um, there is no delineation of only warning the voters of the first year's impact. It, the, the governing body has the latitude to, to express the, the tax impact in the manner they wish to, but there's no um, delineation on first year. So just because there's no first year impact doesn't mean there's not a tax impact. The second aspect is that Article 5 from 2013 um, used the word estimated tax impact. So, I mean, certainly one could estimate the interest rate and estimate the 20 years or whatever. 
I, I believe that you may, you, obviously you get your advice from the town attorney, but if you go forward with this without a, a um, tax impact statement, I think you're exposing yourself um, to being in violation of Article 5 from 2013 approved by the leg legislative body, and the word is required. It doesn't say that you may have a fiscal note. It requires it, and that's required in the statute, 32, five, uh, 32 colon 5, Roman numeral 5B, um, which is, you know, the language of the Article 5 from 2013. Yeah. So, yeah. Understood. I, I think I've made my point. Yeah, no, well taken. Good point. Um, I'll just have a final question on, on Mr. Nichols' comment. Do we have a fiscal impact note that was calculated at, at a prior time that we could share with the folks here today? And if the answer to that is no, it's no. I understood Mr. Nichols to suggest that he thought he had seen a note prior. There was a note on um, one of the drafts of the warrant prior, yes. It was in regards to a possible interest payment of $63,000. And let's see. The fiscal impact note for $63,000 would be uh, 0 0.023 or 2.3 cents per thousand. Okay. I believe that's the fiscal note that was on one of the earlier drafts of the warrant. So before I, I get to uh, Mr. Zanoy, I think the, the question uh, or the spirit of Mr. Nichols' comment was that um, prior Warren article on fiscal impact notes, but also uh, isn't it appropriate to let the voter know if this is passed, how much it would cost estimate uh, on an annual basis, at least at the beginning. Um, to give sense to give folks a sense of, of the magnitude of this project on the on the taxpayer. So uh, let me go to uh, Mr. Zanoy, are you next in line? Morning everybody. Jerry Zanoy, 16 Presidential Circle in Hampton here. I have the uh, the uh, draft, the um, warrant as it was presented in the public hearing it has that fiscal impact statement there. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have trouble with this sewer bond article. There's three or four or five things happening, yet we don't know the incremental costs for each one of those. I'd be curious to see if the washdown shed was the majority driver of this $2 million bond. We don't know. Um, I'm on the budget committee. I was a member of the budget committee the last two years. And the budget committee tried for about six to seven weeks to get in and evaluate this article per RSA 3216, Roman numeral two. We were disallowed. We couldn't get in there, look at vehicles. We couldn't get in there and study this thing to the degree that we wanted to, three, four hours, which is allowed by law. I don't know what it was, lack of confidence, I know the wastewater plant, I was in there for six to seven months in um, 010 and 011. I know how the plant works. Some of these articles he has, some of these elements he has in the sewer bond are, I think can be genuinely considered needed. Other, other elements he has in here, I really question. We haven't had an alternate generator since the plant formed. Nothing's ever happened. So I turned to one of my colleagues and I said, if we rented one, how fast could we get it and how much would it cost? And I, what I really got there for a response is we could get it really quickly. I didn't get a cost for a response. That would have been one of the questions I asked if I was allowed to get in there and do some evaluation. This uh, washdown shed seems to be a throw-in to the whole sewer improvement program. Where did that come from, a washdown shed? Now, some people have referred to me as being pork in the bean barrel here. Let's get, this, let's get the washdown shed thrown in with these other three or four critical items, and we get the whole thing together. That's why it was, we, we were trying to drive at the incremental cost. We never got them. I understand the piping arrangement that he wants to do, because in 010, that was pointed out by the state. 
as something that we should do over time. It wasn't absolutely required by the state. We got them to back off that position because we grandfathered ourselves with the original construction of the plant. But it's something that, you know, probably should be done over time. But is it a must? I don't think so. Um, the valve pit, I don't like the valve pit. I've been down in it with one of the guys. I don't care for it. I think it has got some safety issues associated with it. So what I'm saying is some of these elements are critical and needed and some are not. It's, to me, the fact that we couldn't get in there. Mike Pluff uh, was my colleague. We were appointed by the Budget Committee to go in and do some evaluation to carry back some sediment. We desperately tried for six to seven weeks. We couldn't do it. Finally, at the very end of December, we were sent an email, meet me at the town hall in the Selectman's Conference Room. What am I going to do evaluation in the Selectman's Conference Room? I have to see vehicles. I have to see the piping arrangements, you know, the schematics. I have to understand this. I was in that plant, as I said, when we were on corrective action notice in 2010, where all buildings stopped, all bathroom additions stopped. So I know it quite well. I'm very familiar, familiar with it. My colleague is very familiar with vehicles. But I guess we proposed, must have proposed a threat or something, I don't know. But I really wanted to get in all honesty and be objective about it and get some sediment. I could never arrive at a sediment. But I say weaknesses with the sewer bond with, with this, this wash down shed that seems to be put in there with an alternate generator for $500,000, actually this, from one of our select meetings, 100,000 is, 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 is grant available. But to really discuss the, the salient issues of every one of these elements to see if they're truly needed, where are they? Are they must items? Are they should be items? Nice to have items. Try not to understand that. Couldn't do it. We failed. So we went back to the budget committee and said, look, <laughs> we don't have that sediment. And uh, even though I do have some sympathies with the wastewater plant because I was in there for seven months, and I really wanted to confirm what they were trying to do, I just couldn't do it. I'm sorry about that. I really am. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Zanoy. Yeah. My name is Regina Barnes, 95 Presidential Circle, and I just wanted to state simply that we're talking about the future of the status of the water in our town, water draining into the harbor, and I am in full agreement with the Board of Selectmen on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Mr. Kravitz. Good morning. My name is Sonny Kravitz at East St. Cedar Drive in Hampton. I want to explain, I'm on the budget committee, I want to explain why the budget committee split 7-7. This is an important article to pass. It's not necessarily a 30-year bond. It's the fact that we got in with turf flow with the Board of Selectmen because they, last, summer, last winter we had $300,000 in snow removal. The Board of Selectmen voted to take 300000 out of surplus. Budget committee said, budget committee is made up of three, there are 14 people on there. Three of them are former selectmen. They said, you know, the Board of Selectmen can't draw from the surplus without the approval of the budget committee. The budget committee voted to send the Department of Revenue a letter objecting to withdrawing the funds from surplus. And they agreed. So we ended up in a turf war with the Board of Selectmen. A number of votes were four to one. The, only, the one vote was Mary Louise Woolsey. Yeah, Mr. Kravitz, I gotta get you on, on the yeah. uh, article what, here. What we were trying to do was to visit, the, the budget committee once is charged with preparing a budget for the town. We wanted to, in the past years, we. Go to, we interview each department and ask them questions because there are always new people coming on board. Yeah, Mr. Kravitz, I'm going to give you one last opportunity. I need you to speak sorry, on the, the sewer article. I'm going to hear from the chair yeah, of the budget okay. committee on the what budget. What I'm trying to moment. say is that we ended up in a turf war, and the board is, it's, this is an extremely important article. It doesn't necessarily mean a 30-year bond. It means we're looking for funding for 
doing improvements. You're seeing what the t town of Portsmouth is dealing with with EPA. They're going to spend 80, 90 million dollars to upgrade their facilities. The wastewater treatment plant is we're playing Russian roulette with it at this point. Okay. You know, it's an important article. All right. Us. Thank you. Thank you for your sentiments. Mr. Jones, before I get to you, I've got to follow my rules. I've got to hear from people who have not yet spoken. We've got two gentlemen who fit that category. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nick Bridal, 225 Toll Farm Road, Hampton. Uh, I'm on the budget committee as also as well, and I did vote in the affirmative for this. My question is for the Department of Public Works uh, head. There's got to be, if these upgrades don't get completed, and um, one of these aeration pipes were to fail due to the backup generator, um, there's, I'm assuming there's some fines and some costs incurred from the EPA. Uh, if something were to do where we weren't keeping up with um, what's going on, if we don't have these things in place, the emergency generator, and things go bad, I'll be at a low risk. What, are, what is the town looking at for costs in, in, as far as fines go? And a follow-up question to that would be, is there any chance in the next few years, if we don't do these upgrades now, that we are going to be mandated by the federal government to complete these upgrades and uh, potentially at a further cost to the taxpayer? And I will yield my time to the department head. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bridal. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, quickly, uh, Mr. Bridal, two questions. If noncompliance, does that result in fines? And are we subject to being mandated in the future if we don't address the items that are contained in this article at this time? Uh, yes. Uh, the EPA does maintain a, a daily fine schedule of $37,000 a day for noncompliance. Uh, the probable, if there were a, let's say, a multiple day release, what would happen in likelihood is the same thing that happened back in 2010 and 11. You get an administrative order through the Department of Environmental Services with the state. Uh, they're giving, they would give us uh, uh, time to uh, design and implement the project. In the meantime, they would probably uh, clamp down on the issuance of, uh, of uh, new connections. Uh, we've already been down this path once with dewatering. Uh, so that's probably the, and the cost would be uh, slightly more than I would say the current cost because one of the things is that we are getting a $100,000 energy savings grant uh, to apply to the um, generator portion of the project. Uh, and so things like that may not be available at the time we, if we were ordered to do it through the EPA or the state. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. I'm going to go to Mr. Pierce. <clears throat> My plan is, since the day is young but it's getting older, is to run through to Mr. Jones, get Mr. Jones's comment, and then see if we're ready to move on to the rest of our day. Mr. Pierce. And I saw you, Ms. Latimer. So we'll have Mr. Pierce, Ms. Latimer, and Mr. Jones, and we'll see if we're all set on Article 10. Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Uh, Mike Pierce, um, 84 Lock Road. Mr. Zanoi brought home a very important issue. If you want to see why we need something in this town, the town should be able to show us why we need it. The budget committee's responsibility is to make the budget. <coughs> and I have never had a problem spending money on something that we need. If you don't know what you need, it's hard to say how much money you should spend. The lack of cooperation in this particular issue was pathetic. Under state statute, they're supposed to cooperate with the Budget Committee so they can make a good decision on how much money should be spent on anything in this town. That's a statute. That's not Mike Pierce. That is a state statute. And the these selectmen, along with the town manager, balked at every time they turn around trying to form a good budget this year. And this one uncle is a good example of them not even letting us see the plant, see the vehicles, or anything. I'm thoroughly disgusted with the way they behaved this year. If it was up to me, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't approve any. No. Mr. Pierce, I yes. think you know that it's all set. We're all done. We're going to go to Ms. Latimer. You've made your point? Okay. All right. Ms. Latimer. Good morning. Eileen Latimer, Chairman of the Budget Committee, Resident 251 Mill Road. I'm not going to talk to you about a turf war or how this year went. I'm going to talk about this. Warren article right here. And I'll 
started out by saying that all members of the Budget Committee responded very well when we were faced with the crisis on the Church Street pump station to the tune of, I believe, 4.2 or $4.6 million in the 11th hour. And in that 11th hour came before us and gave us all the details that we needed to make that emergency decision and endorse that particular project. It worked out well for everyone and it got completed. In this particular case, what you have is a bundle of four different entities. They were brought this way, as you saw the slide presentation, to the Budget Committee. In the end, I can't tell you what the breakdown is for the four different articles, and I don't know if anyone here sitting here today watching the same PowerPoint presentation can do the same. That's the problem. It's $2 million, it's four projects, I can't tell you, nor can seven members, at least on this committee, tell you what that breakdown is, what we're buying for $2 million. Yeah, there needs to be that dialogue back and forth. It's not unreasonable. And it's not unreasonable as we represent the taxpayers to let them know through us sometimes what those four projects would have been. In the essence of dealing with the sewer treatment plant, we're all in the same spirit of that. We want it to run. We don't want it to be fined for it. We don't want to see it broken down. But when you go and you ask for a $2 million bond and you've bundled four projects together, I don't know if everyone sitting in here or everybody voting would have wanted to vote for washdown facility as much as the sewer lines. But yet it was bundled and the prices weren't broken down and if there's someone sitting here who has seen something broken down in those costs for those four projects as it's presented here to you today, please come and correct me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Latimer. Mr. Uh, Jones for the wrap-up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Earlier when I asked the question about uh, the risk being stated by the TPW director as being low, and if this one article were to pass, that it would be lower than to quantify that. And instead, what I got was an answer about how much fear I should feel. No estimation of how much low, lower we get if we pass this Warren article. And this is essentially the problem that we were facing in the Budget Committee. How do we properly evaluate this Warren article when we're giving a lack of information? To cast a knowledgeable vote on $2 million. And that was a quandary that many on the Budget Committee had. Some of that resulted from us having sent uh, representatives from the, sub, from the Budget Committee, uh, representatives that were on the Budget Committee that had expertise in this area. I certainly am not an expert in, on these matters and relied on them to go get the necessary information, ask the necessary questions, and, and basically vet those answers. That process wasn't allowed to take place. Another black hole in trying to evaluate this. Also, uh, I would note from a process point of view, uh, these Warren articles, especially these money Warren articles, these bond Warren articles, have to go through a series of public hearings, as well as through the Budget Committee. And it cannot be a substantial change in that process. If there is, then you have to begin the process anew. There was a tax impact on here. I believe the removal of the tax impact is a substantial change and the process was not begun anew. So I consider it from a process point of view a, a violation. Also, I would note the tax impact statement problem is more than your normal one because, uh, well, you might say, well, what interest rate would you calculate in your tax impact estimation? Well, you can kind of do a guesstimate, which is what we normally do. But then you have, well, what's the amortization? Are we doing 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, 30 years? Well, we don't know. This one article says, not to exceed 30 years. So that would have been another number that the finance department would have had to pick out of thin air that they were going to use in their calculations. So that becomes yet another problem in trying to calculate the tax impact. This problem, this Warren article is, has got a series of problems, most of which are related to black holes and, and, the, and the, uh, the financing means, you know, up to 30 years. Well, be specific. There's no reason why we can't be specific. Have the tax impact. There's no reason why there can't be a tax impact. And Mr. Moderator, I find that uh, previous comments uh, about there being a turf war between the Budget Committee and the Board of Selectmen to be very offensive and 
and uh, not accurate. And uh, I think it's manifested right here. Their turf is up there. Ours is down here with the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Lang, I'm going to do what I, I, I do, I'm going to do what I said, but I got two pieces of information I want to share with the body, and then we can decide where we want to go. Um, Mr. Zanoy handed me a, um, a uh, earlier draft of the warrant. It did contain a tax impact note, and on the $2 million, it was 71 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Mr. Jacobs gave me a breakdown of some of the components that we've discussed over the past hour. Septage receiving station, 950,000. Washdown facility, 330,000. Internal yard piping, 80,000. Safety improvements, valve pit, 90,000. Emergency generator for aeration tanks, 550,000. I tried to do the math quickly. Just a tick over $2 million, and this was an earlier um, estimate. So uh, we've talked uh, a lot about this article, um, got a lot of information from uh, DPW and a lot of thoughts from budget committee members and other members. Are we all set discussing? A procedural question. Sure. Yeah. Really quick. Does this deliberative body have the ability to separate this article into four different questions? You know, I, I think it's, um, I'm going to try to answer your question by saying you can't take any piece out. DRA would say that changes the subject matter. So I've tried to give you the, the dollar amount. So no, as far as if you're saying A, B, let's vote piecemeal, I would say no. no I'm talking about breaking this article up into four separate warrant articles. Do we have the authority to do no, that? Thank no, you. No. Um, so uh, back to the question, all set discussing it, or would you like to have further discussion? All in favor of closing out discussion on this article, raise your voter card. Down card. All opposed. We will uh, move on.